Good morning. Um, yes, I will be discussing the study of neon 20, neon 22, P gamma reactions, and which goes into sodium, 21 and 23, that I've been working on at the University of Notre Dame. So just a brief outline. The, <laughs> the background and motivation, um, I'll be talking about first uh, some stellar burning, including hydrogen burning, why my reaction's important for that in the neon sodium cycle, therefore the astrophysical importance, some previous measurements that also help motivate this work, as well as uh, then we'll move into the actual first measurements that I've been working with, with the strength measurements, the setups that we have for that, as well as the results that have come from that, moving into the more major portion of my thesis work, which is the cross-section measurements. And I'll talk about our new accelerator at Notre Dame and the gas target that I'll be using to complete this reaction. So first, just a little background of stellar burning, a little astrophysics refresher for everyone. So when stars are forming, they have a hydrogen core, and the hydrogen is fusing into helium. We call this hydrogen burning. And as the helium uh, gets formed from the hydrogen, it collapses down towards the center of the star, creating a helium core. As seen here, helium core with a hydrogen shell. Once the hydrogen the radiative energy from the hydrogen being fused is no longer enough to combat the gravitational collapse down. It collapses down until it heats up the, the helium enough to start the helium core fusion burning. And it goes through this phase of where it like kind of expands and contracts the gas until it can ignite that helium. And then you get helium core fusion. This continues throughout the star's life creating shells of the various elements. And as you saw in Evan's talk, the nuclear binding energy chart this gets us all the way up to iron here at the core, and that's where we can no longer process uh, nuclei in this way through fusion. So you end up with all of these shells of matter with the hydrogen uh, outer layer moving inwards, getting heavier and heavier. And you'll notice we have some neon fusion in here as well important for my work. So some of these thermonuclear reactions that not only generate the energy of the star, but they synthesize all of the elements that we see and therefore aren't of interest for basic science and lots of other components. So the stellar burning I just talked about gets us up to iron and fusion. So up this chart of nuclei, we have the proton number and the neutron number. And this fusion just takes us right along the valley of stability here, up to iron. But obviously, we know that there are plenty of more elements, and so there are other processes that get us up much higher. Two of them, the S and the R process, are neutron capture processes, S being the slow and R being the rapid. And this is where the neutron capture competes with the beta delay, uh, beta emission. And so the slow one, S process is where your beta decay wins out over your neutron capture. That those times are much quicker than the neutron capture times, and so you're able to stay closer to the value of stability. Whereas in the R process, the rapid neutron capture process is where your neutron capture beats out those beta delays, and so you get pushed farther and farther along to the neutron line. You get some really interesting nuclei out that way, and our lab does a lot of research in that on our process, it's very exciting. Uh, conversely, there's the RP process, which is the rapid proton process. And this is the converse of the R process. For neutrons, we have it for protons instead. It's where it beats out the gamma decay, and protons can then capture up and push towards the proton drift line. But for my work, I like to stick down in the fusion area. In fact, I deal mainly with hydrogen burning. So going back, hydrogen burning is the combination, it's the fusion of four hydrogen atoms into a helium atom, and it releases a bunch of energy into the star. But it would be improbable for four protons to decide to collide in this gas and fuse, because that's a big Coulomb barrier. So scientists had to come up with theories and prove that this was correct for um, reaction rates and stuff, of different pathways that hydrogen could be fused into helium. First one is the PP chain. 
This is a, occurs in lower mass stars, such as our own sun. It takes up most of the, how our sun creates energy and converts its hydrogen into helium. We have two protons, which are more likely to fuse together. And then it continues to grab one more proton at a time, kicking out gammas and neutrinos, positrons, and converting some of those protons into neutrons to make it more stable. You get two of these chains going together, you end up with two helium threes, which then fuse, kick out some extra protons, and you've got your helium atom, which can then move, gravitate towards the core. However, in higher mass stars, such as Sirius A, where we have 1.5 times the mass of our sun, we can use heavier elements that exist from previous stars' explosions reforming into new stars. So we have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen in the core, and these use as catalyst sites to fuse those hydrogen atoms into uh, an eventual helium. And the CNO cycle is really interesting because as a cycle, it starts at carbon-12 and it also ends at carbon-12. So you're never, you don't need to be able to replenish these nuclei in the star, they're just used as the catalyst sites. However, I use a completely different cycle that I'm interested in. The neon sodium cycle is a breakout from a hot CNO cycle. This is a CNO cycle that branches into even heavier elements because the mass, the star's mass is up higher. We're talking like 0.5 gigakelvin, so things much hotter. You have to get up to higher Zs. From there, if you have, when you have uh, neon and sodium, magnesium in your star, you can capture protons and move along this network here until you get to a sodium 23, which then kicks out an alpha and gets you back to neon 20. This continues to advance hydrogen burning, but is not a significant source of energy for the star at all, because these, it takes more energy to like fuse these <laughs> together than would be worth it for the star to get out. However, this is the process by which we see the nucleosynthesis of neon, sodium, and magnesium, so neon signs of Las Vegas can think this cycle. This reaction network is interesting because the first reaction, neon 20 P gamma, is the bottleneck in terms of reaction rates. It has the slowest reaction rate, or predicted reaction rate, for the whole cycle. The closest runner up is neon 22 P gamma, both of which I'm working on in this work. So that's of particular interest, astrophysically speaking. Additionally, in the 1970s, Klaus Rolfs and Kynon also studied these reactions for these particular reasons, because they're interesting. Specifically, the strength value, the strength of a resonance, is proportional to the cross-section. So you measure the strength value, and then you can reason out what the cross-section is to lower energies for, of astrophysical importance. However, within two years of each other, 1975 and 1977, they came up with two different values separately using various different techniques. One used a gas target, one used solid targets. That, and they got strength values that don't agree. So in 2004, um, one of our students at our lab re-measured it. Unfortunately, this work was never able to be published due to various time constraints and things. So I have his number from his thesis, which is more in agreement with Rolfs, but being able to publish this work would help advance nuclear theories and the astrophysical modeling codes that need to use these reaction rates. So we decided we would do it again. Furthermore, to understand the motivation behind using, measuring the strength values of these reactions is to understand the direct capture cross-section to low energies. These low energies are where it'll be astrophysically important. These are the energy regimes that the stars will have in their cores that we'll be able to see uh, that we need for our astrophysical modeling. However, it's much easier for us to measure a sharp resonance up at a higher energy. So we can measure this resonance value here and then make a measurement of these lower energies relative to this high, higher uh, energy resonance here 
in order to cancel out some of our experimental factors that are harder to determine. And here's just a, the theory behind why the strength is important. Looking at the cross section, the bright Wigner cross section value sigma here, we need this omega gamma, which is the resonance strength factor here to be able to get that. And since that's unknown, that's a big unknown factor in our cross section. Okay. So for the strength values, we used just our accelerator at the Nuclear Science Lab. This is a set, our laboratory setup from several years ago now, when we still had two accelerators, the KN and the JN, feeding into our target room here. This was one of the last experiments done with our KN accelerator. It's a medium size uh, energy range. It goes up to about 5 MeV and that's it. Um, along here we have our tandem accelerator. It goes up to about 10 MeV. But for the energy range that I need, the KN was perfect. So we performed our tests in this target room here. We impinged a 10 microamp proton beam at a 45 degree angle to um, implanted neon targets. Our targets were <coughs> consisted of neon 20 and neon 22 and natural isotopic abundance of neon implanted into tantalum beryllium targets. And then at 45 degrees, we had our germanium detector here, which was placed on a sliding, distance, sliding table so that we could vary the distances. This is important because as you move farther away, your summing corrections disappear. So as the gammas come out of the target, if more, if multiple gammas of different energies enter the detector at the same time, the detector sees the sum of all that energy. But it really wasn't a gamma of that energy, it was multiple gammas of various energies. So as you move farther away, that's less likely to happen. And so you measure it far away and at close, that way you can factor out the summing corrections using ratios. Place the detector at 45 degrees because this is an ideal angle for uh, angular distribution corrections. This is a minimal angular distribution corrections that need to be made. It's a, kind of like a standard that we use. We have a 45 degree beam line. <laughs> so here's some sp sample spectra from our targets. These are both from target one. Um, we have neon 20 and neon 22 implanted in this target. So scanning to different energies, you activate, you can direct capture into these various nuclei. The top one uh, is the neon 20 and the bottom is neon 22. Along the y-axis is counts. Along the x-axis here is channel, which is correlated to energy. As you can see in the neon 20 p gamma, there are not very many gamma rays that come out, which doesn't give us a whole lot of statistics being able to see. You can analyze each of these lines. Um, and the only one that has the ability to um, get a single or double escape peak is the 3.5 MeV line, because that's the only one that has enough energy to do that. Oops. However, neon 22, which we've measured the neon 20 relative to, has a lot more lines in it, and some that get very confusing in the 6 MeV region. It also has one very strong direct capture line at 9.5 MeV. And this is one of the most important ones because it direct captures into this line and it doesn't have any other feeders that go into it. So this is like a pure line from the reaction, whereas 440 KeV goes from 440 to the ground state. So all the other gamma rays feed into this level, this energy level, and so you get a lot of extra analysis involved in this ground state transition. So we're interested in the strength value, but what we measure is the counts coming out from this reaction. And to convert these counts into our strength measurement, there are a couple other experimental factors that we have to be able to reason out. So here is the strength value equation. The integral of our yield, which will be sort of a nice Gaussian curve going over the resonance, as you saw in that picture with the direct capture, we'll take the integral of that over energy. But that has to be multiplied times, or divided out the number of atoms in our target. So we have to do extra measurements on all of our targets to be able to reason out how much neon, 
has been implanted into each of these targets. And as an example, use the NEON-22 implanted in beryllium to show when you do um, the scattering experiment off of the implanted target, because of the difference in Zs, that NEON has much higher Z than beryllium, the NEON peak separates out, oops, quite nicely, not yet, separates out quite nicely. <laughs> However, you also see, because neon and oxygen are much closer together, that you get an oxygen peak on top. So we have to cut that part out, and then we can take the integral of this and get a very well-defined amount of neon atoms. This is a very important factor because it's uh, error directly corresponds to how much error you're going to have in your strength measurement. And that's where our measurements are also advancing, is that we're trying to get our error much farther down than the previous measures, that which already don't agree. From here, similar to how we did this one, we're able to get out the number of neon atoms in our tantalum targets, as well as in our naturally enriched um, neon. And this target is very special because typically when you're implanting a target, you bend the beam through a dipole magnet and you're selecting a specific isotope that you want. The neon 20 and the neon 22 are typically not able to be implanted together. However, if you have a specific setup where you don't bend it through a magnet, which we happen to have at one point in some lab taken, like a scenario taken down in our lab, one of the professors was like, this is a great opportunity to just implant straight isotopically enriched. This helps you because then you can take isotopically enriched in ratio, you can just take the natural ratios of how the neon 20 and neon 22 are naturally, and that helps make the number of atoms in your target easier to get out. Another factor that we have to know how to get to, it has to do with our yield. So this has to do with the experimental counting of our gamma rays. One factor we have to, A, we have to get the number of counts out. We also have to know the amount of beam that we have, but those are very easy to measure experimentally. We keep track of those as we go. The efficiency, however, of our detector has to be very well known because we're measuring gamma rays all the way out to 10 MeV. So we have to know our efficiency all the way out to 10 MeV, which is typically not measured. The efficiency of a germanium detector when you're using it in the lab is typically only measured out to like 3 MeV. And they call that good enough because then you can map the curve. But we needed it much farther out. So we use a couple of various sources, cesium, cobalt sources, as well as several resonances in the well-known aluminum 27 p gamma reaction to be able to measure our efficiency out to 12 MeV is what we were able to measure it out to. And this was done, we measured the absolute efficiency instead of a relative efficiency, which is a more difficult uh, measurement. But now we can use this curve for that detector as long as we spot check with a couple of uh, sources. So I'll be able to use it again for my cross-section measurements, will be, which will be nice. So from that, all of this information goes in, and we're able to finally get out the NEON 22 strength measurement. We measured our NEON 20 relative to the NEON 22, mainly because the NEON 22 had two papers that were more in agreement with each other. And doing a relative measurement is much easier. You can divide out some other experimental unknowns that are harder to um, get out and absolute measurements take a lot more time than a relative measurement. So first, the NEON-22, and we are various backing. So we have three different targets with NEON-22 in them. And they were with, in agreement with each other within the, the error bars. Uh, if you'll notice, this is still an improvement in the NEON-22 to previous measurements as we reduce the error greatly. Um, we would, we're typically using this middle number, like these two average out pretty closely to this middle number here at uh, 12 EV plus or minus about 20, or 0.2, sorry. So using that, we have the NEON 20 P gamma strength values. So these were our first goal, and we were able to finally get to that. As you'll see, the natural target compared to previous, the NEON 22, you can see that the natural target here has a lot bigger error bars. That's because NEON 22 is less, uh, 
less abundant naturally than the N20. And so you see a much clearer uh, yield curve here for that one. However, what we're able to do is get two values with these two targets that are within agreement of each other, as well as get a very small error bar on this isotopically enriched target. We also tend to agree more with the Rolfs data, which was also previously done with um, Professor Steck's thesis in 2004. So that was kind of good. We can just cross that one off the list. Um, so now that we have a strength value that we're confident in, we can continue making, the, we can work on creating a new cross-section measurement. So to do this, my advisor was like, well, the old accelerator that you used, we're getting rid of, we're getting a new one. I said, cool. He was like, you're gonna be the only grad student involved in building it, it's part of your thesis work. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so for a year, I spent my time in a four foot concrete building inside this tank here, uh, <laughs> constructing our new accelerator, <laughs> which is a 5U accelerator. From there, the beam line will come down into our rhinoceros gas target, which was developed in the 80s in Stuttgart, Germany. And then they stuck it outside because they didn't want to use it anymore. And our advisor said, I'll take it. <laughs> so they shipped it from Germany so we can have it. So it's very dirty. <laughs> and it's my baby. So <laughs> it's huge. It's about a meter by a meter square and has about 11 pumps in it. So we're going to use this system to make this direct capture measurement here. So again, relative to this resonance, we're going to measure down to low energies using this gas target. So it's a little about our 5U accelerator because it's our new toy and we love slash hate it because it was installed three years ago and it still doesn't work experimentally. It works and we can get beam out of it, but it's not good enough yet for some of our high precision measurements that we want to make. Um, so it's a 5 MeV tanda, uh, 5 MeV single ended machine here and it's vertical as opposed to horizontal like our previous machines were. And it goes into a 90 degree bending magnet which analyzes the energy down to this switching magnet here which has three beam lines that come off of it, you can't see very well, into one of our prides and joys, the St. George recoil mass separator which has yet to be commissioned because we can't get good beam out of our accelerator. And then we have also a target area here, this is, needs to be updated. Um, is dying. Um, where we have germanium detector array and then my beam line, which comes off of here. So when this was installed, they took lots of pictures with you know the golden dome in the background and it's very pretty, terrible, ugly tank that's huge. The tank had to be lowered onto the platform, which was built, and then the walls were constructed around the accelerator itself. So these. Uh, Walls were constructed of high density concrete because the existing building surrounding it is all offices. And we decided irradiating the director of the physics department is a bad idea. In true Notre Dame fashion, the president of our college, Father Jenkins, came and blessed it with holy water. And I was like, that's why it doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work. So we're using the rhinoceros gas target because there's a lot of um, advantages to using a gas target system. The target's indestructible. You're constantly pumping gas into it. Whereas on a target, you could be ablating things off in your target. You can be degrading your target with too much beam. You can melt right through it. As well, there's no background from your target backing. So that tantalum and beryllium backing gives us signatures as well. But we won't get those when we make our cross-section measurements. We'll have very clean, neon um, spectra, it'll be beautiful, I hope. Um, also, we can easily vary the thickness of our target. The higher the pressure, the thicker your target in this area that you're gonna be shooting the beam through. And we can make relative measurements very easily by mixing two gases. This allows us also to reduce some of the annoyances of doing gamma spectroscopy, such as straggling and uh, background effects from stopping the beam in the, into your target. So this is a schematic of the rhino gas target. The beam comes in 
And then there's a series of collimators, which slowly and slowly shrink farther and farther down. And the entrance of our disc-shaped target chamber, also known as the octopus chamber, um, is about two millimeters. So when I designed my beamline for Rhino, we had to do so many optics calculations to be able to dis discuss what magnetic elements and focusing elements we needed in our beamline to be able to pinch the beam down to two millimeters and where that target needs to be. So the placement of Rhino was very precise. And then the placement of all of the magnetic elements along the beamline was also very precise, down to a centimeter, which when you're dealing with meter large things and having to use cranes to put them into place, it's not exactly easy. So along this disc-shaped detector, we're going to have several silicon detectors monitoring at various degrees. Also, because it's disc-shaped, we can put a germanium detector right up against the front. So we get this really great uh, germanium detector energy resolution. But the counting ability far away of kind of a nice collimated silicon detectors. So currently, this is Dr. Steck here. Uh, the beam line from the 5U to the target room is complete, and this can be seen in this picture here. And then the beam line for my gas target is also complete. It's here. Currently, I am refurbishing our ancient gas target. The testing the vacuum pumps has been done. I turned them on and nothing exploded, which was nice. And I'm currently working on reprogramming all of the controls, which were analog, and then recently had been updated to a digital control. And they weren't done correctly, so I have to fix all of that. And then we have to do beam development, in-beam testing of this target area, which will tell us how those simulations worked, which from previous experiences is going to be a little touch and go. So in the next year, we'll have to do some optimization of the beam line, characterize our target region, repeat the target tests um, from our previous targets, the implanted ones. We want to redo those with the 5U and a germanium detector array as a proof of principle for the array as well as the 5U. So that'll be nice to see if our previous measurements with an accelerator that we trusted can be repeated with the accelerator that we don't trust so well. And we're going to perform in-beam testing of the gas target, hopefully this fall. Then I'll perform and analyze cross-section measurements, and then I get to write my thesis. So hopefully all of this goes smoother than it has in the past three years. <laughs> and this is most likely what it'll be like. Maybe I'll start with the acknowledgments, which I'll end with. So I wanted to thank all of those that helped the nuclear science lab and the support staff, as well as the other graduate students who have helped and the postdocs help construct the beam lines, perform these experiments. And I would like to thank the Corell Institute for the wonderful opportunities. With that, I'll take questions. <laughs>